I hope this is finding you well, that you and your families continue to stay healthy and safe, and that everyone is holding up in these unprecedented upside down times that we are finding ourselves in. We are grateful that you're joining us today for the fourth webinar in ADL's Fighting Hate from Home series. For today's call, we are proud to partner with the Secure Community Network to discuss the important and timely topic, Zoom bombing and other threats to your video conferencing. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our moderators for today's call, George Saleem, ADL's Senior VP of Programs, and Michael Masters, SCAN's National Director and CEO. As Senior Vice President of Programs, George Saleem leads ADL's education, law enforcement, and community security programs and oversees the work of ADL's Center on Extremism. Prior to his appointment at ADL in 2017, George served in the administrations of Presidents Bush, Obama, and Trump. He most recently served as the Department of Homeland Security's first director of the Office for Community Partnerships. Concurrently, he was selected to lead a newly created Countering Violent Extremism Task Force to prevent violent extremism in the United States. Before assuming these roles, George served for four years at the White House on the National Security Council staff, where he focused on policy development and program implementation matters for both domestic and international security threats. Prior to his work at the White House, George served as a pol senior policy advisor at the DHS Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. He has also worked at the US Department of Justice, the Arab American Institute, and served one year with AmeriCorps. ADL is proud to have George as a member of the team. Michael Masters is the National Director and CEO of the Secure Communities Network, or SCAN the official safety and security initiative of the Jewish Federations of North America and the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations. Previously, Masters served as the Senior Vice President of the SUFAN Group, a strategic international consultancy. Prior, Masters served as the Executive Director of the Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management for Cook County, Illinois, as the Chief of Staff for the Chicago Police Department and as an assistant to former Mayor Richard M. Daley. A graduate of the universities of both Michigan and Cambridge, as well as Harvard Law School, Masters received a commission in the United States Marine Corps, attaining the rank of captain. Certified as a peace officer, Masters continues to serve as a part-time police officer. We are grateful to him and SCAN's partnership in producing today's conference call. Michael, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me begin by extending as well, first of all, my appreciation for Deb, that uh, lovely introduction. Uh, my mother would be very happy. Uh, and also thank all of you and wish you uh, a safe and safety and health at this time. I particularly want to recognize our, our partners at the ADL, and foremost amongst them uh, is my friend and colleague, George Saleem, without whom these collaborative events over the last two years would not be possible. And of course, that starts from our leadership, uh, Jonathan Greenblatt, uh, as well as at the Jewish Federations of North America, Eric Fingerhut, and the Conference of Presidents, Malcolm Holmline. I'd also like to recognize the security directors who are joining us on the call, the Jewish community security directors who are working in their communities and around the country. As many of us, as 97% of Americans are at stay at home orders, uh, it's important to remember that the work of safety and security continues every day in the Jewish community, but also more broadly. And with that, I think all of us should take a moment to recognize our first responders, the men and women on the front lines of our communities in law enforcement, the fire service, EMS, and of course our health workers who are in our hospitals working to combat the pandemic we now face. The dynamic work that ADL and SCN along with all of you are doing to raise awareness, combat hate and extremism, as well as anti-Semitism and ensure the safety and security of all segments of our community and particularly the Jewish community is needed now more than ever. As we prepare this week to recall the Passover story and the Jewish people's liberation from slavery, the need for vigilance and awareness has never been greater. Our right as a Jewish community and as Americans to worship as we please continues to stir the hatred and ire of others left unchecked. This will result in a growing cost for far too many. Thanks to the work of ADL and SCN, 
all of you and our communities and law enforcement and other first responders around the country, we are addressing that hate, extremism, anti-Semitism, and the issues of safety and security. As we remember our challenges we faced as we came out of Egypt, we now confront the same hate and recent tragedies around the country, but we will survive and we will grow healthier and stronger, both through this pandemic and the safety and security issues we face. I wanna thank the ADL for their incredible partnership and George for his incredible friendship. George, over to you. Michael, thank you. Thank you for the very warm kind of handoff and, and same back to you. Um, thank you everyone for joining this call today. And I just really wanna echo um, Michael's introduction as to the, the collaboration and partnership uh, between uh, both of us and our respective organizations um, that has really led uh, to countless efforts uh, to protect and secure um, the communities that both JFNA, SCAN, and ADL uh, really serve, uh, not just across the country, but across the globe. Um, and we look forward to continued opportunities to collaborate uh, amongst one another on these critical issues um, of today. Uh, I also wanna uh, acknowledge that, that really none of this could be possible without uh, the tremendous leadership by both uh, Eric Fingerhut at, at JFNA and Jonathan Greenblatt at ADL, who have really set the tone uh, for bringing uh, communal organizations together during times of need, during times of crisis. And there's no more uh, greater need uh, for coming together and partnering in a time of national crisis than there is today. So Michael, I, I very much appreciate the partnership, the friendship and looking forward to, to engaging uh, throughout and, and hopefully soon after this COVID period is over. Um, it is my distinct uh, pleasure to introduce my colleague uh, who joins this call today, Orrin Siegel, who's the Vice President of our Center on Extremism. Orrin will provide a, a detailed overview as to some of the threats that we see affecting communities across the country um, that I know our 25 ADL regional offices, Federation uh, uh, executive directors across the country, as well as Federation security directors have been on the front lines of dealing with. Uh, by way of background, uh, Orrin currently serves as the Vice President of the Center on Extremism at ADL, um, which is a team uh, set up to combat extremism, terrorism, and all forms of hate, both in the real world as well as in the online space, which we'll be talking about today. Recognized as, as truly the foremost authority on extremism, uh, the center that Orrin leads provides resources, expertise, and trainings, which enables law enforcement, public officials, internet, as well as technology companies to both identify and counter these emerging threats. By way of background, Oren joined ADL in 1998 after working for the New York Times and the Jewish Community Federation actually in San Francisco. Much of Oren's 21 years with ADL has been devoted to evaluating both the activity and tactics of extremist groups and movements across the ideological spectrum and to include training with law enforcement officers as well as putting out reports and articles on a range of extremist topics. In 2006, Oren was recognized by the FBI for his exceptional service to public interest and was named one of the forward's 50 most influential and intriguing and inspirational American Jews in 2019. So Oren, if that's not a good line to pass the mic to you, I don't know what is. So I'll, I'll, over to you, Oren. Thanks very much, George. Really appreciate uh, the intro and, and thank you, Michael, as well. And thank you all um, for joining us uh, for this meeting. Uh, I join Michael and George and all my colleagues um, in hoping that everybody's settling in uh, to this new reality that we are dealing with as best as possible and that you and your families are all safe and healthy. So as this pandemic continues to impact our lives, our communities, and our sense of security, ADL and the Center on Extremism continue to fulfill its mission. You know, during times of uncertainty um, and anxiety, uh, it's even more important than ever to track and monitor and expose extremism and hate. Uh, extremists really never miss an opportunity uh, to exploit a crisis and to further their hateful agenda. And we too cannot miss an opportunity to respond. You know, whether it is by spreading their xenophobia, their anti-Semitism, their messages of conspiracy theory about this virus, which we have reported on and which was the subject of a previous seminar, be it threatening to weaponize the actual virus itself um, by targeting communities with coughs and sneeze, uh, be it actually engaging on the ground, whether it's through propaganda, 
or as we saw in Missouri, where a white supremacist actually targeted a hospital filled with those who are dealing with the coronavirus and who was motivated ideologically in part by anti-Semitism. So we need to make sure that as extremists adapt, we are also adapting uh, to the realities. This pandemic has led more and more people to spend more and more time at home, conducting school, conducting business. Um, an increasing focus has been on the technologies that we are using in order to maintain some level of normalcy. And I will say that this time connecting with friends and community online is really more precious than it's ever been. You know, remote learning and classes and religious services, community support, you know, this connection is as uh, significant as it has ever been. And that's why these efforts to disrupt these communities, these online video conferencing, often with hate and harassment, is so critical to understand now. The more that we know, the better we are going to be equipped to respond and to protect ourselves. So let's just start with a definition here. You know, many people have seen reports of Zoom bombing, which has quickly sort of gathered a lot of attention around the country. It's a reference to video conferencing platform that we are literally using right now to speak to you, um, in which these meetings are disrupted by graphic or threatening language, often including hate speech. So there's the definition right there. And at ADL, we've received over 80 um, reports of such, of such Zoom bombing, primarily reports about this uh, impact against the Jewish community, but not solely against the Jewish community. And we have also looked at, you know, dozens and do dozens of others that have not necessarily been reported to us. You know, these are being conducted both by, you can call them pranksters, you know, kids who want to disrupt their class or perhaps get out of class, but also by those extremists, again, who never miss an opportunity to leverage the latest technology for their malicious purposes. So how does this work? How does Zoom bombing actually work? In many cases, whether you're a synagogue or a community organization or any other type of group, you will put out publicly, sometimes privately, links to your Zoom meeting, in part because you want people to join, you want to you know, uh, um, uh, amplify the message, hoping that more people will learn about it. And so these are very public. And that's one of the ways that these links get out because no one's trying to actually hide them. And what happens is, and here's an image of a slide on Discord, which is a, basically a gaming forum. Um, you see discussions about, these are primarily kids talking about looking for you know, more codes for Zoom meetings that they want to then use to prank or to harass. So anytime there's a meeting and it's publicized so that people join, anybody can access that. And sometimes private um, meetings are also uh, provided publicly. Um, and if anybody reveals that to a greater public or posts it on some social media account, that's then made more, private, uh, more public. So once your Zoom link is out there, and our partners in SCAN will talk more in a bit about how to protect these meetings themselves, what does it look like? What are the types of things that are happening? And here's just another screenshot. And it includes, but not limited to, uh, sharing offensive content. I'm sharing my screen with you all now. I'm sort of describing on a slide what we're seeing. Well, if we allowed anybody to share a screen, what would happen is anybody could share any type of imagery that they want, as you actually see on the screen. People can make notes on a screen uh, under certain uh, settings. Posting messages in the chat function. We have a chat function going on now. Some people leverage that to express their hatred. Um, using virtual backgrounds. If you see me, you'll see I'm sort of hovering over New York City. Well, clearly that's not where I actually am. And so those virtual backgrounds can also include hateful content, memes, imagery, etc. And then ultimately, some people are able to unmute their microphones. So the disruption takes the form of terrible things that are said or actual video of themselves doing these things. So extremists are doing pretty much the same of what I just described. It's not just the pranksters and the trolls. Extremists are able to do the same thing. But what extremists are doing 
is talking about target, targeting specific communities, whether it's the Jewish community, the African American community, the LGBT community. Sometimes it's not a specific target or a minority group or meeting that they're targeting, but it's the type of content that they're putting out there that is filled with, say, racial epithets or swastikas or other symbols of hate in order to create harassment and intimidation. And so that use of language and symbols are actually clues as to why somebody may be deciding to disrupt a specific um, meeting. And we have found that many of these uh, links are on public or very uh, um, you know, um, well-known channels, be it YouTube or Facebook or Twitter. Others are on more um, you know, uh, 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 smaller platforms or platforms that are harder to sort of access, whether it's the Discord that I mentioned. But we also see some people are literally videotaping and recording the incidents of Zoom bombing to then leverage later on. So they will post a Zoom bombing in order to encourage others to do so. Um, very similar to what we see with swatting. And I'll just very quickly say swatting is um, when very sort of popular in the gaming community, um, where people will actually try to harass others by calling police as they are literally live streaming their gameplay. And the idea is that a SWAT team comes into somebody's house because there's been a false report that somebody has weapons or is going to do something bad. And all of that is videotaped or recorded and then posted online. We're sort of seeing similar type of tactics being used with some of these Zoom bombings. Now, many of the Zoom bombers try to conceal their identity. They're not going to use their real names. They'll use fake screen names. They'll turn off their video so you can't actually see them. But in some cases, we've actually been able to identify um, a known extremist. And in this case here, an individual known as Andrew Ar Ar Arnheimer, he goes by the name Weave, was responsible, we believe, for at least two incidents in Massachusetts and California, where he targeted specifically Jewish audiences by, in one case, shouting anti-Semitic language, and in another case, removing his collar to reveal the swastika that you see on his chest there. Now we've known about him for a long time. He has a long history of publicly expressing anti-Semitic and racist views and exploiting technology in order to gain attention. In 2016, he claimed credit for white supremacist flyers on you know, thousands of network printers on college campuses around the country. You know, he is essentially a white nationalist activist. And the fact that we can link him, we believe, to at least two incidents suggests that in some cases, this may be more coordinated. That this is not just some sort of lark by somebody in the community who wants to you know, set somebody off. But when you have somebody with his background who has been involved, it's very possible that these are going to be coordinated efforts specifically targeting the Jewish community. Now, other examples of Jewish groups being targeted include synagogues and schools and universities, nonprofits, community organizations. You'll see some images on the screens here. The first one on the top, it's a trope about Jews controlling the media, a classic anti-Semitic narrative. And in the chat during a Shabbat service uh, of a London synagogue, that was some of the discussion. Again, using that chat function in order to harass the attendees of that meeting. On the left is a Zoom bomber shared a screen and typed KKK into Google Images. Excuse me, this is on the right. And what you see is a whole bunch of clan related imagery that shows up by merely doing a screen share of a very basic Google search. Also, an anti-Semitic language and memes being used uh, during a speech at Yeshiva University president to his student body, again, in the chat function. The number of these reports are increasing every single day. And so while there are those that are doing this as a prank, we cannot underestimate the number of those that if they are not extremists are using extremist language in order to harass, in order to make people feed off of pe people's fear and anxiety during a very divisive time. Now I wanna be clear, this is not just impacting the Jewish community. And I'm gonna conclude here. There have been a range of Zoom bombings that have been targeted other religious institutions, um, including 
um, alcohol anonymous meetings, community organization, business meetings. I mean, private meetings as well because they got publicized. You know, in April, there were multiple classes at the University of Washington that were targeted, including a biostatistics uh, seminar when a Zoom bomber wrote the N-word on the screen. And according to a report in that student newspaper, messages also included in the chat uh, called student racial slurs. Again, these are moments where people are trying to find community, trying to find opportunities to create normal discussion with colleagues, with friends, and with family. And that's why this is particularly disturbing. And that's why it's so important to people to protect their video conferencing. I will tell you, this is not just an issue that started with Zoom. At ADL, we've been speaking out about hate and harassment online on multiple platforms for years. This is just the latest. As more and more people are spending time at home, so are the extremists who are looking to find ways to leverage the technology to harass people. So with this sudden transition to virtual meetings, and many people learning about Zoom and how to protect themselves for the first time. I think it's a good follow-up to this very basic overview to learn about how you can protect your meetings and your communities. And this is where I'm very happy to hand it over to Dina Weiss to talk a little bit more about those elements from SCAM. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Dina, if I may, I just wanted to uh, very quickly introduce you uh, to the group also, and, and Dina, thank you for taking time to join us today. Uh, by way of background, uh, Dina Weiss currently serves as the Chief of Staff for the Secure Community Network, or SCN. Uh, Dina has extensive experience serving the Jewish community, nonprofit, and other kind of public sector entities. Uh, prior to her current role at SCAN, uh, Dina led public affairs and community engagement efforts uh, for the Consulate General of Israel to the United States, uh, Southwest, Southeast section in Washington, D.C., and served as the press department of the embassy in Israel in Washington, D.C., where I know we share lots of uh, friends and, and mutual colleagues from her previous role. Uh, Dina, thank you again for joining today. I'm looking forward to hearing some recommendations um, uh, in the security realm uh, that folks on this call should be keeping in mind. So, Dina, over to you. Thanks so much, George. Appreciate the introduction and uh, the opportunity to be on the call with everyone today. Again, my name is Dina Weiss and I serve as the Chief of Staff for the Secure Community Network. I'm pleased to be here for this timely conversation. As we just heard from Oren, the same extremist ideologies and nefarious actors who seek to inspire fear and cause harm in our physical spaces have now moved into our virtual spaces. Given that we're all on this Zoom webinar right now, we have at least a passing familiarity with this space. For some of us, Zoom and other video conferencing platforms have been an integral part of our work for years. For others, this might be new territory that we're attempting to navigate as we transition our work and our personal lives to virtual communications. I can tell you as the daughter of two rabbis, uh, we're all working to adapt to this new dynamic and the struggles that come with that, especially as Passover approaches. With that, want to share some simple best practices we can all follow to protect our spaces from the disruptors about whom we just learned. As a note, the guidance I'll briefly speak about is specific to hosting on the Zoom video conference platform, given how many of us use it on a regular basis, and noting that the vulnerabilities that these actors we just heard about um, have exploited are specific to Zoom. Other systems might have similar capabilities, but you should refer directly to those platforms for more information. I'll also note before uh, getting into the, the specifics, that this is not an exhaustive list. Zoom has a lot of functions and capabilities that you can take advantage of to make your meetings engaging, but also secure. So I'm going to break down some of these recommendations into pre-meeting considerations, things you can do while you're in a meeting, and what to do if an unwanted person joins your meeting. So first, when you're scheduling a Zoom meeting, Zoom automatically provides users with a personal meeting ID. You'll see up on the screen, this is usually what it looks like, it's a nine digit code. This is basically a reserved meeting space that is always open and available to you, specific to you. You should avoid using it. Given that it's static, it never changes, uh, anyone who has that ID 
can access it at any time, which leaves you vulnerable. Instead, you should take advantage of the randomly generated meeting IDs that Zoom creates for each new meeting. For an extra layer of security, you can also password protect your meetings. You'll see below on the screen, uh, this is what it looks like when you go in to start a new meeting, to create a new meeting. You have the option to generate that automatic new random number, and you can also select that box that says require a meeting password. As you should do with your online accounts and logins, use unique passwords for each meeting and try to make them difficult to guess. Next, settings. In a standard Zoom meeting, by default, all attendees are equal participants. We recommend making some adjustments to those settings to limit the potential for issues. As we've heard with many of these incidents, an unwanted actor will join and then project offensive content using the screen sharing feature. You can limit who has the ability to utilize that screen sharing feature. As the host, you can disable it for others and, and limit just to yourself. And you can change that either prior to a meeting starting or while you're in the meeting. Similarly, to avoid unwanted content from being shared with your attendees, you can adjust file transfer and the in-meeting chat settings. Zoom allows you to share files, and most of you should know that um, based on other meetings you've been in, uh, you have the ability to, to provide that to other people through um, the file transfer setting. But as the host, you have the ability to change that. You can limit the types of files that users are able to share within the meeting, or you can disable it entirely. Depending on the purpose of your meeting, uh, you might consider making those changes. Additionally, with the chat function, you can adjust those settings. A lot of you are utilizing the chat right now to ask questions and, and share your thoughts, um, but the host can, can limit who can participate in the chat, who can, they can send those chats to, and they can also disable it entirely if they choose to do so. Now that you have um, some steps you can take to proactively protect your meeting, let's start a meeting. So, the first thing you want to think about is not allowing meeting users to go into the space prior to the host arriving. If you're the host, consider utilizing the waiting room. You can enable this in your settings and it will automatically apply to all of your meetings. Once you start the meetings, the attendees who, have, uh, who are joining will be displayed in the waiting room function and you can either admit or remove them. You can even chat with those who are in the waiting room prior to the meeting starting. One note, those uh, who join throughout the course of the meeting will still be placed into that waiting room and require the host permission to join. The waiting room function gives the host the ability to screen participants before they might become an issue. Once you have all attendees present in your meeting, consider locking your meeting. This will eliminate the possibility for any new attendees to join. One note on this is that this locks the meeting to everyone, including people to whom you've sent the link and who you might want there. So you should consider waiting to lock that meeting until you have everyone you want in the meeting, and then you can lock it. Once you're in, you've got your meeting started, how do you control the space? As the host, you should familiarize yourself with all of the controls in the in-meeting function. You have the opportunity to start a meeting early, or even go into your personal meeting room without inviting anyone. You can uh, take some time and sort of play around with the features and familiarize yourself with them prior to being in a meeting. Some of the most important tools I think we all know are the ability to mute, also unmute, and stop video for participants. While these are obviously useful for addressing an unwanted individual in your meeting, for most of us, they're also invaluable for keeping things like background noise out and helping out attendees who you know, might not realize that their, meeting, their mic is uh, muted or unmuted, and also the same for their camera. We've all been on lots of calls like that. Finally, consider designating a co-host. You can do this prior to a meeting when you're setting it up or while you're in the meeting. This is a, a second layer of support um, to assist you, especially helpful if you are also running the meeting, uh, having someone with the same capabilities and control as the host who can address technical and technological issues 
if you have an issue with someone in your meeting, et cetera. The likelihood of your meeting being infiltrated by a bad actor is relatively low, but all of these steps can help limit the possibility of the event and prepare you. We do know, and I saw many comments in the chat that this has happened and, and people have experienced it. From personal experience, I can tell you it happened to me this weekend with just a gathering of friends. Luckily, had a friend who was hosting who was quick and recognizing an unknown participant, were able to kick them out. Precisely what you should do. If an unwanted person joins your call, you should immediately remove them. That's why it's important to know what all the controls and functions look like in your Zoom meeting so you can quickly resolve that issue. Zoom default settings uh, do not allow removed users to rejoin a meeting, but you should double check your settings to make sure that you're, they're configured for your preferences. If you do experience someone unwanted joining your meeting and causing an issue, you should report it. I'm gonna turn it over to Michael now to provide specific reporting guidance. So thanks, Dina, uh, appreciate it. And we know that there are lots of questions in the, uh, in the chat that are coming in. Um, I would just make the broad observation that uh, part of the purpose of the webinar is to increase awareness and uh, give people a sense of the perpetrators behind a lot of this, which Warren and his team are working on every single day. Um, obviously, there's a lot of resources, both from ADL, SCN, and, and Zoom itself to answer specific questions. With respect to reporting, we encourage communities, every community is unique, um, we encourage communities and individual organizations to work through the, the best reporting authority that exists within your jurisdiction. Um, obviously, things that need to be reported to law enforcement or that contain uh, threats or issues that require immediate police response should always be sent to law enforcement. But in some communities, that means going through the ADL. In others, it may mean working through a Jewish community security director, uh, whether they're working for the Federation or with Federation SCN. Um, but, but please follow those protocols to make sure it's vitally critical that ADL and SCN have a uh, documentation of these incidents and events. It goes in not just to the incredible uh, anti-Semitic audit that is done every year by ADL, but is used by the team at COE, uh, working collaboratively with our team at SCN to be able to track, document, and be ahead of the curve on a lot of these issues and these incidents and these bad actors. And I, I just also want to make one other quick uh, announcement that wasn't referenced, but uh, for those that have not seen it, the joint report that came out yesterday from COE and the GW Program on Extremism, of which Oren was one of the co-authors along with Ryan Greer, a uh, colleague from, from ADL, and, and Seamus Hughes, another longtime partner at GW, and their teams uh, was an excellent read on the white supremacist terror threat that we are now seeing happen in real time in many of our community organizations. Uh, in the Zoom space. Thanks, Michael. Just a couple final notes for everyone. If you are hosting a large convening or would like a greater level of control, you might consider a webinar. That's what we're in right now. It does require a separate license from a general Zoom meeting license, um, and it varies by capacity, but it provides a greater peace of mind and it might be worth it. Finally, regardless of the size of your meeting, the content or perceived importance, you can and should take steps to protect your virtual space. Thank you for your time. Chag Sameach to everyone, and I'll turn it over to Deb. Uh, thank you, Dina, and thank you to all of our panelists today, to George, to Michael, to Oren. This was fantastic. Uh, and I have to say, the chat has been populated with great questions, and so we're gonna get right into that. Uh, first, the first one's an easy one, and even I can answer that, which is yes, this is in fact being recorded, and we will be distributing it. So that one, uh, that one is solved right there, and I feel pretty confident that that is going to be the only one that I am able to answer. So let's get to it. Uh, so one person writes, as a person that manages some nonprofit websites, I'm concerned when I see the Zoom links publicized in the event calendars. How would you suggest getting the links out in different ways? So I'm, I'm happy to take the, uh, the first crack at that. One of the things that uh, we advise as best practice, whether it's a physical event or a cyber event, is not to publicize the locations of events openly in open forums. 
Uh, obviously, the security implications for that physical security when our community is open for business can be uh, serious and, in fact, at, at times deadly. But we encourage that same following advice. Uh, in an open newsletter, it's prudent not to include the Zoom link or the physical location of an event. Uh, if you have a registration platform that you use to designate regist registrants, uh, then email them separately. And as Dina talked about, you can then use that email address to allow specific people into your Zoom event. They're associated with that, that Zoom with that email address when they're coming into the Zoom platform. But the same, same counsel, physical event, as for a cyber event. We don't want to publicize openly uh, in open forums as best we can. We'd also point out when you're having people join your newsletters, uh, it's a good idea, if you can, to vet who you're adding on to your newsletters. Uh, we do this as a point of practice. Have them sign up, have them hit it. If there's an auto reply function where they can add some additional information uh, that you can collect about the individual, their organizational affiliation, backup contact information, or even having someone call or email them to confirm that. It also gives you added points of contact as an organization, whether you're planning events in the future or donor events or whatnot, that you have other means of getting in touch with the people beyond just the email address that they submitted. Got it, thank you. All right, next question. Is Zoom bombing solely meetings getting hijacked in the ways described, or is there a back-end way to hack the system that we can't control and it's in Zoom's hands? Yeah, I, I'll, I, I'll start there. I think the majority of the, the Zoom bombing is happening because people are learning a new platform Right, we've gone from you know 10 million users to like 200 million users or something astronomical, and so people are 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 getting a sense of what the settings are, um, and so most of it is because people can, uh, you know, may need to learn a little bit more about how to protect their platforms. Is it possible that you know there are some sort of deeper um, hacking? Uh, it's possible, but what we're seeing is really not about that. Now, I am not going to be surprised when people become expert Zoom users and know exactly how to protect their accounts that there still be, will be efforts by extremists to try to find other ways to exploit it. And again, I wanna underscore this is not just about Zoom, but for the most part, this is not about hacking. This is about good online hygiene when using Zoom. I think I, I'll just add to Oren's uh, statement, which I agree with entirely. If you look at general cybersecurity practices, well over 90% of cybersecurity uh, breaches, according to most publicly available reports, are due to human error. That's someone putting a thumb drive into a computer. It's someone clicking on a link during an email. So very similarly in supporting what Oren said, a lot of what we're seeing is just human error or lack of familiarity with the platform. Anything can be hacked. And at some point, uh, I completely agree, people might be moving to that with, with any online platform. But right now, what we can do is make it harder for them to get in uh, by publicly advertising the meetings and events that we're having. Thank you both. All right, here's another one. We've taken all steps to secure meetings and webinars, but still fear a hack. When a hacker is identified, is there any legal action that can be taken? Lauren, I think you're on mute, my friend. Thank you. I think, uh, thank you for that, Deb. I think one of the things that we're investigating here at ADL is very much looking at these cases that have occurred and to see if there's any litigation opportunity. I mean, listen, it's hard with somebody like that known neo-Nazi hacker that I mentioned about. People have been looking for him for many years because he's been involved with so much uh, hacking and harassment online. Um, but to the degree that we're able to connect people and then maybe hold them accountable, I think they should know that there may be some legal remedies um, and that there are organizations that are exploring that right now, including ADL. And I think George has, uh, can talk further about that. I actually just wanted to pull in uh, Michael and Brad on this question as it relates to kind of partnership with state and local authorities, when and how to engage some of the best practices that you all have seen. I, I, I wanna kind of bring that thread into this, this response as well. Yeah, if I may, good afternoon, everybody. 
I, I think it's important. There's a couple items here uh, above and beyond Zoom bombing. Brad, can you, Brad, I didn't get a chance to introduce you. Can you just do, introduce yourself for 10 seconds? Sure, sure. My name is Brad Orsini. I'm the senior uh, national security advisor for Secure Community Network. I joined that uh, in January this year. Three years prior, I was the security director for the Jewish Federation of Greater Pittsburgh. Prior to that, I spent 28 years plus in the Federal Bureau of Investigation. I, I think that's, that's a great question. And, and as it, it goes to legalities and, and process against each and every one of these hackers and threats, one, it's going to vary from state to state. It's also uh, going to depend on what the information was put out. But I, I, I feel the need. We have 1,400 plus people on the phone here. We could not ignore any of these. We need to report everyone up the food chain. That includes to, if this was pre-COVID, we'd be calling law enforcement right away. Calling law enforcement right now for a Zoom bombing, we're not going to get a lot of response. However, we do need to have a reporting mechanism to our law enforcement partners. Second, we need to push up to the scan duty desk and to ADL, every one of these. It's very important. But with the legal parameters, we've seen this uh, across the country, each one separate and different. But if we have the information, we're recording today's events. If you have a Zoom uh, conference, if there's a recording of it, we can turn that over to law enforcement. Every jurisdiction is going to look at it a little differently, but I don't want to dissuade anybody from not pushing that information up because they don't think law enforcement can do anything with it. We need to hold law enforcement accountable. I am law enforcement. I come from law enforcement. They're great partners of ours. We have to share everything with law enforcement and to see, and then what legal process comes from there, we will handle but we need to make sure we do that. We need to really assess the threat that's out there, whether it's a kid Zoom bombing us or a white supremacist. So everyone needs to be reported and we will make that determination on each separate one. Hey, can I, can I just add one thing real quick? Because as we encourage people to report, I think we are also going to try to arm people with what to do when they're actually being Zoom bombed so that they have something to report. And so I just want to emphasize that we'll be putting out some tips about when this is happening, and it could be shocking, recording what you're seeing, you know, saving certain elements of the information, that will all be super useful when we elevate it not only to scan an ADL, but to law enforcement. And we will follow up with those tips that we're developing on how to deal with the Zoom bombing as it's happening. Thank you. So here's another one. Zoom has been mentioned a lot. It's even in the name of the webinar. Have you run into similar problems with Google Classroom or Meet? What about Skype or FaceTime? Do they have similar security issues? So I'll, I'll start with this. Thank um, you. As far as uh, the reporting that we've received, the vast majority of incidents have been over the Zoom platform. One of the reasons for this is that all Zoom meetings are nine digit IDs and it's possible to randomly select those numbers and attempt to get into a meeting uh, given that information. Zoom also has several features that if you do not adjust your settings make it a little bit more susceptible to this kind of infiltration. That's precisely why I went through the, the guidance and are providing additional guidance um, through the uh, chat, I know we provided uh, the SCN materials and ADL has materials as well to support um, the settings you can adjust to uh, mitigate some of these vulnerabilities. Turn it to Oren if he has anything further. Uh, yeah, Dina, I, I, sorry, uh, Dina, at some point in, in this thread uh, after Oren goes, can you just go back and spend 60 seconds on locking a Zoom call? You got a lot of questions on that portion of your presentation. And I just think that we should go back to that for a moment um, before, before we move off this topic. Oren, sorry, back to you. No, no, I would agree with Dina and just say, you know, there are very unique sort of uh, issues um, with this platform. It's not that Google Meet doesn't have some other type of issues and, and other platforms. You know, when people are doing YouTube uh, live chats, there's super chats in which a lot of extremists um, and other hate is, is part of that. We've seen that when we've done congressional testimony, for example. So there are other issues. This is unique because of the functionality of Zoom. 
Um, and that's why, uh, also to underscore what Dina said, we're getting so many reports of this. This is the focus now. So Dina, before you go into that question, the other thing that's been popping up a lot is how you kick somebody off of a call. So maybe those two are some good technical tips that we can move to. Happy to do so. And broadly what I'll say is, as I mentioned um, uh, previously, really recommend spending some time if you are the host, if you manage um, an account and uh, have the ability to set up uh, a meeting where you can uh, sort of play around with the, the settings that really will help familiarize you with the process and, and look through the different options you have while you're in a meeting. That said, uh, while you're in a meeting, as the host, you have the list of participants on the right side of your screen. Next to each participant, there's a drop-down menu. In that drop-down menu, you have options such as mute, uh, stop video. There's also the uh, remove from meeting. That's how you kick someone out. So if you identify, the easiest way to identify that is if you, you know, if you have all of your participants muted in a meeting, which is generally best practice, so you avoid the background noise and, and errant conversations, um, you'll see someone who's making noise pop up at the top of that participant list. It's pretty easy to identify who that actor is in that case. You can quickly select their drop down list and remove them from the meeting. Other options in there, um, if, if you want to use them, there's an option to put someone on hold where you don't fully remove them from the meeting, but they're no longer able to participate. And if you're utilizing the waiting room feature, you can also send someone back to the waiting room. Those are all options. Great, thank you. So understandably, there's also been a lot of questions about how vulnerable are small family and friends Zoom sessions. Uh, you, you mentioned one this weekend with your friends that was Zoom bombed. And as everyone is preparing for holiday celebrations over the next couple of weeks, I think this is a really good one to look into a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as I said, the likelihood of it happening is relatively low, but we know that it does. And these steps that we've outlined and, and the guidance that's provided is your best line of defense. Um, adjusting your settings going in and making sure you understand what that looks like. Those are the best steps that you can take. Uh, we should absolutely be utilizing these forums. There's, there's no need for us to, to back off from this technology. It's great um, and, and supports us, especially as we attempt to gather in this new dynamic um, during the Passover season. And, uh, and so encourage you to spend some time reviewing these settings and, um, and reach out to Zoom or whomever the video conference provider is for technical support. They recognize some of these, they recognize these issues and uh, they're working to address them and, uh, and are happy to support us in that as well. Thank you. Here's another one. I've seen reports about Zoom recordings being leaked and posted publicly on the internet. How can we make sure our meeting recordings are secure? I, I can jump in on that to start. Um, so Zoom, when you record a meeting, uh, you can choose to record it either directly to your computer or to the cloud. Um, when you do that, it record, once you're done recording, it takes some time to process that and then it automatically names the file. One thing you can do is go in and rename that file to something less obvious. The, the automatic naming um, uh, notation is whatever you name the meeting. Um, so if you named it, you know, something very obvious, like your Shabbat gathering or Passover gathering, someone could search a key term for that and it is accessible. So one of the best things you can do is just go in and rename the file once it's downloaded and it will make it less accessible to others. Thank you. You've got all the practical tips. You're a good woman to know. All right. Next question. Are you seeing reports of perpetrators using fake identities? For example, if I were to search the names of board members of an organization and then sign up in their name and then bet that somebody wouldn't notice or would think that I was a, a sanctioned participant. Have you seen incidents of this happening? Yeah, so I just, I think, I think the best way to think about this is that this extremism and these efforts to disrupt did not start with Zoom, right? We were talking about seeing individuals um, being sort of harassed online on Twitter and Facebook and Gab and 4chan. And this is just the latest technology. 
And so people will use every sort of available way to mask themselves, especially initially, right? You use a different name. You don't make it quite obvious that you're there to disrupt. It's then you sort of build in and get in, and then that's where you sort of then overwhelm people. And so that's just the classic standard way of doing it. That's why it's really important when you're setting up a Zoom is, you know, ask people to register, like on this call. Don't provide that password immediately. Provide it after the fact that people have registered. That enables people with resources to do a little digging and, you know, to sort of extra, make some extra assurances. You know, the other thing I just want to mention briefly about the recording. The truth is that anybody can record a call like this. I can record this call on my phone right now, whether Zoom is recording it or not. And one of the things that we've seen extremists do is whether that Zoom is being recorded by the host or not, they're going to record their efforts because they want to then, you know, amplify that. They want to make sure that others see this is how you model disruptive behavior. Look, we were able to put swastikas on a Jewish community meeting. There's propaganda value associated with that. So you can't control all recording. What you can try to do is control as much as possible the registration and the settings. And listen, at the end of the day, this will be like some other platforms that we've seen. They will learn. We will help them work uh, to understand how extremists are trying to exploit it. And we'll be off to the next platform dealing with a similar thing. I have no doubt. Thank you. All right. We, I want to be mindful of time. We have just a little bit left. So here's one last question. How do you confront extremist messaging without providing undue desired attention that might enable copycats and give them viral fodder for online consumption based on our reactions? Yeah, I'd like to start with that one. This is a question I get a lot about a lot of the work that we do at ADO, right? Do By exposing extremists and their tactics and their activity, are we actually giving them oxygen, right? Are we amplifying their message, raising their profile? And I would just say this. I, I strongly believe sunlight is the best disinfectant. People will not stand up and you know, be forced to take action or resource to the threat if we don't speak out and expose them for what they're doing. We don't have a luxury to ignore and pretend that this is not happening, certainly at the volume that we're seeing. So the more that we can educate people through seminars and webinars like this, through our public reporting, through the tips that you're getting from SCAN and others, the more that people are aware, maybe some extremists will be happy about it, but at the end of the day, it's going to lead for them to have to change their behavior. And that's what we stand for, and that's what we're going to continue to do. Orrin, if I may jump in, I agree with you 100%. I think we are no longer in the position in the Jewish community we, where we ignore or accept any sign of hate. We need to report everything, we need to assess it, and we need to uncover it. So Orrin, I, I agree with you. Thank you for saying that. It's very important. I've been serving the Jewish community now for three years and four months, and it's changed dramatically in that time. And it's very important from the first day I joined the Jewish Federation of Greater Pittsburgh where people dismiss signs of hate because that's part of the community. That's part of what we expect. We can't act like that anymore. We have to report everything, uncover everything, report everything to keep our community safe. And I strongly believe that. Thank you, Brad. And thank you, George and Dina, Oren and Michael and Sasha for all the work you did in putting all of this together. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. Unfortunately, we are out of time, and so that concludes our Q&A. But again, thank you for being with us. ADL will be continuing to provide weekly Fighting Hate from Home webinars on a variety of topics, and we hope that you will be able to join us on future calls. The recording of this call will be circulated not, uh, in this afternoon's email. And after that, we're just wishing you all a safe, happy, and healthy holiday season from Passover to Easter to Ramadan may be the beginning of better things for all of us this spring. Thanks so much for being here.